Eight months ago, Professor Dr. Captain Popetal Ryman discovered an operational AI-human hybrid that was researching a mysterious problem pertaining to the destruction of the universe, supposedly at human hands. What happened since then? Nothing. Tactical nothing. There was a whole lot of heat they needed to let die off, since their whole crew was happy to blab about everything that happened on Red Kide. They were saved from execution at the hands of Hegemony by the illusion that they had slain a rogue AI and saved human lives in the process. Taking the error bars into account, this was plausibly even true. Those rescued had been taken to Galatia, where they were hush-hushed by the new provost, given eye-opening, catching, watering and releasing sums of money, and put to work carrying on the detailed scientific work of… whatever they were doing. Yes, the details are difficult to get across here. They were, broadly speaking, and or writing, looking for signals in the fabric of space-time that might indicate activity in a place affectionately called the Anti-Universe, and non-affectionately called the Inverse, and most commonly called that mathematical nonsense people once made up to get a paper published without doing any real work. Ryman was once one of those people, and now he was again. In fact, he was at the very forefront of this research, secretly, very secretly. For eight months, he had been diligently directing the IEC in its pottering about the sector, having no close encounters with forbidden entities and logging loads and loads and loads and loads of data about all the rocks out there. Some of the bigger rocks were called planets, and those generated enough data to keep a crew of thousands of amateur surveyors busy for, well, about eight months with the ever-smooth author's note here that the crew only experienced about three of these months because of the timey-wimey aspect of hyperspace jumping. This period of being masterfully undercover at their own jobs, disguised as themselves, soon came to an end. Provost Baird's maths monkeys had come up with such a juicy hypothesis that it was time for the IEC to push the boundaries of science, the law, and how much romantic tension people can tolerate in the workplace. To go where no man had gone before, and all that, but we'll talk more about Lieutenant Contreras later. We rejoin the tale somewhere on the edge of the sector, where a wide, flat asteroid belt soared gracefully around the dusky star Omuzi. It was the largest collection of former planetary matter in the sector. Once upon a time, a very large antimatter explosion had turned half a dozen stellar bodies into half a trillion paperweights, and like moths to a flame, the paper pushers of the IEC had now arrived. Their goal? Another very large antimatter explosion. Could it be that if you take something that was blown up and blow it up again, the effect of the explosion would come full circle and hence push the planets back together? Now we're thinking outside of the box. And just as well, because the box is full of antimatter. When antimatter is involved, the idea that you might reverse time by blowing something up wasn't so silly. Remember the time torpedoes? Boom! There was one now, and what a shame it caused you to forget me explaining how they altered time once again. One key point you missed in the series of 12 fascinating lectures I just delivered is that antimatter reactions cause effects outside of normal space making them the key to the realm of hyperspace. But what if there was another place still that felt the heat of antimatter annihilation? A sort of opposite place to our universe? There was no reason to believe such a place existed, until a few annoying mathematicians proved it would make a lot of difficult science make more sense if there was, because of math stuff. Then some super-intelligent AIs became convinced it was true. Then, everyone died, yada yada, and the long and short of it is that now the IEC Galatia Secret Research Club was going to test for the echoes of this anti-universe among the rings of Omuzi, with said rings promising to amplify the resonant effect with the other side. All up to speed? Boom! A large tank of contained antimatter was rapidly decontained in a flash of light which, contrary to the afore-delivered onomatopoeic boom, was silent as far as those sitting on the bridge of the Gargandua were concerned. Great. Did the scanners get the readings? Ryman asked. Yeah, they did. In fact, they got them before the explosion even went off, Professor Sebastian said from his new science corner. 
Think a bar stool with a hubcap sized slab of steel nailed to the wall. That's… Yes, it's what I predicted, eh? I think it means this whole waste of time is, in retrospect, not such a waste of time. Ryman smiled. Bloody hell. We're actually doing it. Illegal science. Too bad it's going to take cycles to analyse all these fluctuations for patterns. If you can't do the time, don't do the crime, Ryman said. You're very chipper for someone on parole. Not anymore. No? Didn't I tell you? Time explosions messing with your head, Sebi. I'm off the hook. Oh? What about the rest of them? We have names, Allison interjected, to which no one could rightfully disagree. Not them, Ryman said. I was given a pardon, since I saved all those lives in the end. Not the ones I quote-unquote lost, but still quite good, eh? Essentially the reverse of my crime. By that line of reasoning, if I kill someone, then have a child, I should be all even with the law. You are correct, Professor, Contreras said into Sebastian's ear. I should note that Contreras was doing a new thing over the last few days, which mainly involved transferring her close bodily scrutiny away from Ryman and onto the newer, younger model. Was Ryman jealous? Well, let's just say there had been plenty of space to give Sebi more than a bar stool and a hubcap-shaped metal cubby, but the captain's orders were final. It sounds like the science went off without a hitch, and now, oh wait, here's the hitch. From the fading light of the antimatter Nova, a huge battle fleet slammed into reality, emerging from hyperspace with no hyperhole to be seen. Is it the remnants? Ryman shouted at Allison. Uh, was the cheery reply. Titanian, get everything together, would you? Ryman ordered. Aye, was the response. Titanian played with his controls at the back of the room, at which the Demidar showed how the IEC's cloud of ships began shifting, such that the hegemony sacrifice I mean escort ships were at the front, flux shields burning bright to show they really meant business, and or they were really scared of dying. Luds! They're Luds! Alison triumphantly claimed, standing from her desk and walking out of the room amid the sighs of relief. I'll tell the boys to handle it, shall I? She said. The door closed before Ryman could ask her to please come back to her workstation, and in tandem with an image of the strange fleet appearing on the main screen. Shall I stand down, Captain? Titanian asked. Stand up even taller, Lieutenant. Those aren't church luds, Ryman said. It's the Luddic Path battle fleet. At this, the mood soured. To briefly detail this, the luds, the techphobes of the sector, were roughly divided into the peace and love branch, the church, and the tech is good if it lets you kill people who use tech branch, the path. While the latter group was less influential on the surface, their terror cells were found on every planet, in every station, nay in every room if rumours are to be believed. Their pride and joy, their crusading battle fleet, combed the sector, eliminating those trying to scavenge old tech and destroying roaming formations of AI ships. That's a useful enough service that their cousins in the church put up with them, and plenty of planets were willing to give them harbour and supplies. A protection racket who wanted to ban any machine more clever than a clock that adjusted to local time when you got to a new planet. And make no mistake, they would happily nuke the clock factory to achieve their goals. Alas, if only the detonators weren't always set to the wrong time zones. Essentially, they were the anti-IEC, and an IEC-anti-IEC -IEC annihilation event was nigh. Prepare to be destroyed, a less than friendly voice announced. Even with Allison taking a perfectly timed High Achievers sabbatical, Ryman could see all the aggressive pinging taking place on her screen. As rude as it was to introduce yourself with a threat of destruction, or perhaps polite to offer one time to prepare for this fate, Ryman took the high road. Blessed Walker, peace be with you on the path, my dear friends, he hammed, raising his hands to the ceiling. Could they actually see him? Worth a shot. You dare speak? Then I shall only have you reflect on how my path has led to war, not peace, and how you are the culprit machining us into oblivion, the voice said. Nonsense, we have just concluded the destruction of a large supply of antimatter, Ryman explained. Don't you recognize us? We are the IEC. The irreligious errant crusaders. We bring together all people who are not on the path and lead them to its ends by their own means. 
It is our understanding that the use of antimatter fuel is causing a strange resonance with another plane of space and time. Is that not correct? You... you have felt it too, the voice said, dragged from vitriol to surprise. I, 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 traveller, always I felt it, since I was a child, Ryman said. His performance now extended to parading around the bridge, in what might be described as the mad musings of a man facing certain death, but might also be the expert negotiations of a fearless and wizened crafter of excuses for committing capital offences. Tell me, when did you first know that antimatter was so special? Well, when the Great Ones first contacted me, the voice said. I mean, obviously, Ryman nodded. I meant to say, when did you realize that everything the uh, Great Ones said was true? Since you are not on the path, you will not know how easy it is to see the truth. Since I am here to kill you all, I will permit you a glimpse to test your perception. Turn your Demidar to beta neutrino mode. No problem, not a problem at all, Ryman said, while violently gesturing at Sebastian to take a look at the ship's archaic control surfaces and work out what to do. There must be so many beta neutrinos here, given the special nature of the place. There should be a new shrine station built here. You hardly need a beta neutrino demidar scan to show that. I know, right? The church withhold all their funding as if they can't see the truth plain as day, clear for all to see on our fully operational beta neutrino demidar. Ryman was thrusting his head weirdly at Sebastian in order to communicate many different things. Sebastian was shaking his head to communicate one thing in particular. Well, no sense starting to tell the truth now, is there? It's beautiful, Ryman said. The tendrils of the Great Ones. They're so close to us here, the voice said. They sensed you were going to feed them with your antimatter and came all at once to sup on the universe's energy. At once they are like insects on a flower and like gods of death. Their embrace is so warm. So very warm, Ryman nodded. He made a gesture that prompted everyone else to make weird sounds to indicate they were also feeling so very warm in the embrace of the Great Ones. It's a very specific gesture, no time to explain. Why do you deliberately hasten the collapse of our universe if you feel the power of the anti-universe growing? The voice asked. It was not for my sake, friend. May I call you friend? Walker Aquarii. Blessed Walker Aquarii, you must see that we here are surrounded by representatives of the Hegemony Authority and among our crews people from all walks and all paths. We came here because they do not believe that antimatter reactions are anything special. Hence we set up sensors all over this system, knowing that the, well, the Great Ones are very close at hand in this place. By feeding them some antimatter, we are able to reveal, in a scientific way familiar to the Faithless, the reality of the threat posed by, by all the matters at hand and such. I must admit, I do not see any other reason for you to be detonating antimatter in this forgotten place. A good point also. If we were seeking to destroy the universe deliberately, or to subvert the will of Lodital, why would we even be doing this? And why would I, a far-lapsed brother with too many sins to mention, willingly travel with priests of the church in my crew? Ryman motioned to Titanian. Titanian went over to the emergency spacesuit locker, opened it, and stood back to allow Thor and Wens to slump and sliver out. I recognized your voice right away, Aquarii, Thor said from the floor. Oh, they didn't kill you, Aquarii said, softer and pitched upwards now. Never, I escaped to carry on the work of the church in my own way. To think it's a crime to be in love with a pather. You too? Nope, nope, I don't believe it. Nope, Ryman said actively and wisely not engaging with the emerging reality. It's the life hack that never stops giving. I wish I could see your face again, beautiful Bora, Wens now said. Ryman was on the floor, which now left only Thor and Sebastian actually upright. Contreras was doing her leg-locking hug thing on Sebastian, and we must join Ryman in ignoring this. I... I made a mistake, Aquarii said, 
which was the most profoundly true thing anyone present had heard in a long time. The pinging on Allison's console calmed down. Blessed Walker, while we didn't know we would find you here, we only seek to walk alongside you, Thor said. Let them carry on their work, because there is some truth in those old lines. The devil's tree grows more ways than up. Very true, Aquarii quickly agreed. It's profundity on tap at this conversation. I will report your activity to the Path Council, and I will return to administer any punishment they see fit. In the meantime, I will for your irreligious errant crusaders to follow the sage advice of brothers Thursday and Wednesday. Allow them to touch your heart as they touched my... I promise, I promise, I promise! Ryman squawked as he launched to his feet. Let's all do what the man in the cupboard says, and I do think that's a grand idea, and I do think we'll all be saving the universe rather soon, and I do think it's all such a beautiful thing that we all met like this. Let's be on our merry ways, and bathe yet deeper in the wisdom of the Great Ones, or maybe kill them, or a bit of both, alternating weekends, whatever works really. You understand more than I imagined. Hence, I agree. Walk the path, brothers. Aquarius said. That's real naughty, Wednesday said with inscrutable glee. Good talk. Lieutenant Titanian, withdraw the vanguard and put our new commanding officers here back in the locker. I, Titanian happily nodded. And Allison, get us up. Oh, by the grace of Lud and the bloody great ones, can someone find Allison? She's in the sunbed, Ra's voice said. Ra, why are you? We have sunbeds? We have a mattress below the antimatter reactor. It's really the same thing. Tell her to get back here, or the tendrils of whatever it was will find her. She's really afraid of tendrils. That'll probably work. Good idea. During the delay, Sebastian was still fiddling with the Demidar, despite Contreras moaning about how changing the scanning modes was unscheduled wear and tear, and despite his own counter moaning that his trousers were experiencing unscheduled wear and tear at that very moment. And, as ever, it's between all the moaning, arisen by wear, tear, or the warm embrace of the Great Ones, that the real breakthrough science happens. You see that? Sebastian said. It's a signal. Does our detector even work, though? Ryman asked. Not good enough. Can't really tell what it is. It's moving. Lines here and here, starting near us, and coming towards us. I don't really like it. Hmm. Looks like it's clawing at us. Titanian commented from the back of the room. Yeah, it does, Ryman said. Don't you start. No such thing as great ones, Sebastian insisted. Sure, sure, then why else are beta neutrino emissions coming from all around us in weird shapes? Might be something to do with the LUDs, look. Sebastian noted that the strange clawing pattern was even more noticeable around the Luddic Path battle fleet. It seemed to get stronger with every scratch. Wait, what's that? Ryman said, pointing at the corner of the screen. A massive beta neutrino signal, cloudy and chaotic, was shooting right towards the LUDs. Sebastian quickly switched the Demidar back to Demi Radiation Mode, aka Detect Real Stuff, please. Nothing there at all. Back in beta neutrino mode, the cloud was just colliding with the LUDs. The screen flashed white, overwhelmed by a totality of signal strength from all directions. Then, it came up empty. A few mode switches and radio checks later revealed the Luddic path were gone. It's a transverse jump, Sebastian said quietly. Where have I heard of that before? Ryman asked. My research. Thanks for noticing, advisor. Oh, right. Jumping without a hyperhole, isn't it? Yes. I haven't made much progress yet. It is possible. I know it. In fact, we just bloody saw it. How on earth did the Luds get to know that kind of technique? There's no way. I was the only one researching it. Hmm. Unless... No, Noah. She did say she'd been speaking with the Great Ones. I'd rather invoke equipment malfunction. They must have flown right by us and scrambled the Demidar. The Demidar is working just fine, thank you very much, an emergent Allison reported. Ah, our science officer is here, Ryman said. Please, officer, explain the science behind all this nonsense. Science? Never heard of it. I'm here to say that the antimatter reactor isn't at full power anymore. You can hardly feel the radiation, even if you press your face right up against it. That's science, all right. Let's check it then. 
Soon it was revealed that indeed the antimatter reactor on the ship was experiencing power losses. They were fluctuating, fluctuating in time with the strange beta neutrino clawing patterns coming at them from the void. I would guess it's from our experiment, Sebastian hypothesized. There is this long-standing problem with beta neutrinos, since they always get overproduced in antimatter reactions. We don't actually know where the excess energy is coming from, but usually people say it's equipment error, since it pretty much is on the margin of what most scanners will resolve anyway. We must be experiencing some unmeasured energy conservation effect in the aftermath of our explosion, creating those beta neutrinos we see as virtual particles existing for a short time and pulsing with the very aftershocks from the space-time manifold we hoped to measure. So it all fits perfectly within expected results. Okay, great, Ryman said. But are you sure it isn't actually caused by the Great Ones clawing at us from the other side of reality? Somewhat sure, Noah. Even though it's looking increasingly likely that the inverse actually is a real thing? That's just your pet theory. Which the entire Academy is paying to research because it looks so true now. Not to mention we just saw the Luds do the impossible alongside some very suspect and tendril-like readings, which you are conveniently ignoring for the sake of your own fragile career. And Lud would be damned if he were to miss that these signals right now really do look like the Great Ones clawing at us from the other side of reality. I'll grant you that, but your treasurer here looks like an upstanding lady. In both cases, your prejudice blinds you, Sebi. Let's be scientific about it. We have to go where the evidence takes us. Give the Great Ones a chance, eh? This isn't science, it's work. And if I say we got convinced some space gods are causing the beta neutrino surplus and probably are destroying the universe, only because your weird muscle man prisoner's ex-girlfriend jumped us in a dark corner of space and ranted about it at bloody gunpoint. Well, you know, actually, I've seen worse sources make it past peer review. Get this analysis completed and let the science speak for itself, Ryman declared dramatically. By which you mean let me speak for you. The human shield knows his place in the natural order. Let's get home then. Alison, watch the clawing tendrils as we go. Do we have to call them that? Alison cringed. How about the loving embraces of the Great Ones? Oh, that sounds marvellous. Makes me feel sleepy. Do you want to know how it makes me feel? Contreras asked. Ryman was quite sure he already knew and carried on quickly with the business of plotting a course home. Once the engines fired up, the antimatter fluctuations disrupted their acceleration, although not by enough to prevent their escape. And indeed, the tendrils of whatever it might be seemed to follow them in the form of further beta neutrino signals slashing and cutting all around the IUC fleet. After a few minutes, the signals faded, and with a final sweep, they passed through the ships and shot off out of detection range at impossible speed. What was all that about? It was going to be up to the Glatians to find out. This research trip was bringing back much more data than expected. Ryman told the other captains in the fleet that there were birds in all of their Demidar dishes and hence the data was all noise, while filling a top secret data core with all the numbers and Lovecraftian testimony they had gathered. This knowledge bomb was strapped to Sebastian before he was thrown into the pit of his peers back in the office. But we're actually going to have to leave that plot thread for now because while the roguish research was underway, the IEC was about to be assigned an absolutely massive task. Remember peace and hope? Those things, what were they anyway? The core factions were presently on the verge of all-out war, and some scholars believed that peace only exists in the absence of war. And with the population of the core already dwindling amid shortages of just about everything, getting worse each cycle, Hope is again defined as the opposite of how I feel when I see how expensive life insurance has gotten these days. Where was the IEC going to find these nebulous concepts? Why, in a nebula, of course. In our next chapter, saving the universe from the Great Ones will have to wait, because our heroes will now need to save humanity from themselves. New worlds await.